All right, we're going to get started. Um, so welcome to our webinar, Why Engineers Should Learn UX Design. My name is Matt Hoy, and I am a product lead at Udacity. I'm joined today by Gabe Rutner, uh, one of our instructors for the User Experience Design and Nano Degree Program. Today, we will be discussing Gabe's career journey, the benefits of UX design knowledge for engineers, and how engineers and UX designers can better collaborate in product development. Before we jump into our interview, I want to remind our viewers that we will have time for Q&A towards the end of our session. So feel free to type in questions you want to ask Gabe in the Q&A box on your screen. I'll be pulling questions from this list to ask Gabe at the end. All right, Gabe, we're excited to have you on this webinar. Can you please yeah. introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little about your professional journey? Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, my name's Gabe Rutner. I am currently the CTO of a early stage legal technology company called FeatherDocs. Um, I started my journey as a biomedical engineer and statistician. Um, very deep tech, a lot of math, a lot of numbers, a lot of heavy uh, engineering work. Um, through that uh, experience, I worked with some startups, some enterprise companies doing software work. Then I went to Cornell Tech uh, for my master's in computer science, focus on AI and product development, where I spun um, my first startup uh, out of that program. Uh, that company was called Ursa, and we built tools for user researchers and designers. So those were transcription products while doing user research interviews, while talking to customers that allowed those uh, designers and researchers to better understand what they're saying. Uh, ran that company for a few years, got deep into design, got deep into tech, observed hundreds of designers across various types of companies from digital product firms to service companies uh, to understand how they're doing their job and how they're actually uh, understanding their customers better. Um, and now back in deep tech, working on uh, this legal technology venture, but always going back to design as uh, kind of that core founding uh, principle. Awesome, what an extensive uh, background and profile. Thanks for sharing that. So you've collaborated with Udacity before on multiple nano degrees as an instructor, and I'm sure some of our attendees today might recognize you from the Udacity courses they're taking online. Uh, so which nano degrees have you been instructor for? Yeah, yeah, happy to be back. Uh, so my first two nano degrees before this UX a uh, nano degree was uh, for cloud developer and full stack developer. Both of those were programming heavy cloud technology courses. Uh, throughout those, uh, I emphasize things like uh, security and a little bit of UX. And I'm happy to jump in now to really hone that engineering skill set into how to apply uh, to the UX uh, discipline as well. Awesome. Now, speaking of UX, let's let's dive deeper into that and talk about the value of uh, knowing UX design uh, as an engineer. So as you mentioned, you're an engineer by trade, uh, but you're an instructor for our UX designer name degree program, which is super interesting. So what does user experience design mean to you and how would you define it? Yeah, so user experience is really core to every product regardless of the format. So I'm a software engineer. My background is in these deep technical products, uh, but everything needs to ultimately be consumed by some other person. So if I provide a service and that service doesn't jive with someone's workflow or they don't understand the value proposition, well, that service is pretty much useless. So the entire user experience is well beyond just that algorithm of what we're developing or that deep technical thing that will solve the problem. It's more about understanding the problem and understanding how those users think about the problem so that we can solve it appropriately. And as an engineer, that kind of thinking is really valuable so that your solutions are actually solving problems. Got it. So that's awesome. So it sounds like you see a lot of value in UX design. So as an engineer, why is user experience design the topic that you care about? Yeah. So I used to not as much as I do now. Um, so I guess maybe a way to, to hone that is through a story. Uh, I was working on an early technology venture for a medical device company. Uh, it was a little device that uh, would measure sodium uh, analytes in, in urine. Um, and this is for people with hypertension, people who need to know uh, if their diet is adequate for their health. And we were building the tech. We were working with this brilliant uh, PhD who, at, at uh, New York City University who is really honing this benchtop device. And as we were developing it, we were saying, this is great. We're getting more accurate. We're getting better. We're getting faster. We're able to really provide this great value. And then when we started to take this product out to market, we learned, hey, people don't want to do this every day. Effectively, it's a pregnancy test uh, kind of uh, stick where you have to urinate on it once a day. And we kept hearing, why do I want to do that? That's 
not really the most hygienic, that's a lot of work, that's not a pleasant experience. So UX as a fundamental principle really allows us as technologists to take that kind of step up away from that really interesting technical problem and you know, hone in on why we should be solving the problem in the first place in a way that our users will understand and want. Wow, that's a, that's a really great story to, to share the value of UX design as an engineer, right? Sometimes you learn uh, most from, from your failures. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so let's shift to the differences now between how engineers work and how UX designers work. How does engineering scope affect design and vice versa? In other words, are design constraints and engineering different from design constraints for UX? Yeah. So there's two very separate mentalities and kind of the project scope and the process. And in the UX uh, course that I teach, uh, we go through an entire design sprint from start to finish to understand the design thinking mentality along the way of defining the problem. A designer will usually start at the problem definition and an understanding of the behaviors. And the constraints in that realm are much more open and ambiguous. You're looking for an understanding into what the user is trying to do right now to solve problems. And you're looking for pathways and opportunities that you can jump in that are easy enough to solve or, or seemingly easy enough to solve. Engineers come at it from a slightly different point of view, usually. So you'll have some kind of problem definition. You'll have some objective, some business uh, revenue or, or some other metric that you're trying to drive. Um, and you're going in and trying to solve that thing optimally. So you have this idea. You have some kind of software that you can throw at that idea, and you will try to make that software the best possible thing in order to uh, solve it. You might optimize the code. You might ship on a, a variety of different web platforms. Uh, you're trying to hone in on one specific thing and make it great, where a designer is trying to sort of diverge and explore many different options before really focusing on that one thing to understand how to solve it. Uh, that's sort of the high level of how those two areas bifurcate. They, they do come back together. So as the process continues and the designer gets more and more understanding into the space, they will start to hone in on a specific solution. They'll start to say, hey, we have this opportunity area, and now we need to focus on how do we make this product actually something that people will use. And the designer will draw some sketches, will iterate, will improve. And along that side of the process, the engineering team will usually get very heavily involved. The designer will communicate sketches and ideas, the engineers will say we can build it or we can't. Uh, often designers might want to build things that are too out there, too outlandish. Often engineers will want to build things that are too technical and too difficult. So there's uh, sort of an interesting dynamic there. Interesting. I like how you broke those two kind of processes apart and like distinguish them. That's, that's super helpful to know. So how has UX design helped you more effectively develop digital products as an engineer? Yeah. So it's slowed me down, which is maybe not the answer you might expect. But um, as an engineer uh, or just a someone who can develop software in general, the first thing I like to do is sit there and bash out some code that is hacky and maybe doesn't work very well, but kind of takes that idea that I have in my brain and makes it something that people can use. Um, as I've been developing this UX skill set uh, through Ursa and through practice, I've realized that's not really the best place to start. So with my legal technology venture, uh, FeatherDocs, we actually started the company by talking to 70 attorneys in different practice settings. We had an idea. There was a concept of basically taking all of the contracts that attorneys are working on and classifying each sentence and each paragraph of language so that they can find it and use it more effectively. We said, this is a great idea. This would help me while I'm running my business. This would help my co-founder while he's practicing law. Let's do it. When we started talking to people, though, we realized that is a really difficult lift from an engineering point of view because there's legacy systems. And it doesn't provide nearly the value that we thought it would because they have other solutions in place. Instead, what we found out, because we had them do these exercises and we had structured interviews, we had them do we were doing mixed methods research. So essentially what we found out is there are tangible touch points throughout the process across all 70 attorneys that we talked to that can be improved with software. And because we didn't jump straight into code, we found a better idea, something that's a little bit easier to develop initially for an MVP and something that we're now sprinting with and we've got commits for pilots and nearly uh, deployed with that in a very short time period. Wow, that's awesome. So 
from that story, you mentioned a lot of UX design skills, right? Like uh, research methods, design psychology, yeah. ideation, user testing. Um, those are skills that I feel like every UX designer should possess. And as an engineer, it sounds like you really like hone that uh, just through practice. So why is Udacity's UX design and man degree program a good way to learn uh, UX design and these skills that you just mentioned? Yeah, so we basically go through the entire process from start to finish. And along that entire process, the course is designed so that you're practicing these skills, not just listening to us speak. Um, so we can tell you all the things and all of the, the skills in the world, but unless you actually get that experience of trying it and uh, continuously reinforcing it with quizzes and, and so on, it's not gonna stick. Um, so the, the sequence that is uh, put together in this nano degree goes from research, to prototyping, testing prototyping, and then improving the prototype. And that entire gamut of skills really goes from the core, this is what you should do, you try it, you practice it, you new hone it. My course particular, in particular basically uh, goes from uh, an idea, a little bit of research that we provide at the beginning, and you learn from that to build an app along the way uh, in a tool called Figma, which is one of the more uh, trendy modern uh, design tools out there that uh, is a pleasure to work with. Awesome, cool. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, so you mentioned a little bit about um, how UX designers and engineers can really make a strong team uh, when creating a product. So I'd love to like dive deeper into product development and, and your perspective on the whole um, product development lifecycle and where you see it going in the future. So. So can you talk about the future of product development? Like, do you see the interaction between engineers and designers evolving over time? And if so, how? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So as uh, I was exploring the space with Ursa, there are many trends happening. So first, UX is becoming much more prominent in organizations. It's becoming table stakes. Every company who's building a product is now realizing the value of talking to customers earlier and more frequently to inject that kind of insight into the development process. So from the UX space sort of uh, growth, there are opportunities to continue to hone those skills. As far as working between uh, UXers and engineers and technologists, those lines are starting to blur. So what we're starting to see, there are more tools that are existing that start to blur the lines of design into code. So tools like Webflow is a website designer that gives you really minute detailed uh, types of uh, control over the design, but it gives you production ready code that you just click publish and you can ship the product. Um, on the other side, we're seeing more engineers learning this UX skill set and coming becoming closer to their customer instead of just being told how to do some kind of project and given a scope and some little boxes to check off. The engineers are starting to see the value in working closer with that customer to solve those problems. So things like forward deployment engineers, uh, people who are going on site to customers, they're learning these types of UX skills so that basically they can go out, solve the technical problems, but also inject into the business the insight from their customer to drive more value and more uh, improvements. So it's a really interesting sort of merging of the two disciplines into something that I think is going to be exciting in the next few years. Yeah, super exciting. So, so as lines blur between these two fields, so have job titles in these professions, right? Uh, so yeah. I see in your LinkedIn profile, you don't have a typical engineer job title. Can you share a little more about that? Yeah. So uh, as I was founding uh, FeatherDocs, started very early on to realize a lot of the core value in our company will be the algorithm that we're developing. There's a very deep tech uh, model to essentially uh, determine document similarity across huge pools of documents at law firms and companies. And that is a very important part of our product in our company. But more important or equally important is the actual usability and the, the user experience around that. So we made a very early de decision, very deliberate decision early on to uh, basically split roles so that product is not just the tech, but also the experience. We made early hires in UX because we see the value in building a product that is better than the legacy solutions. We are constantly talking to customers because if we don't, we'll fall behind in what they actually want. Um, so yes, I'm a CTO, but the technology is really just one nugget of what we're trying to build. God, it makes a lot of sense. Maybe uh, some people out there will start using your job title too and kind of blending those, 
those two lines in their own profiles as well. So I uh, really appreciate you sharing that. So software engineering and design work very closely during product development, right, as, as you shared. What are some of these common challenges that engineers and designers face when building digital products together? And what are some topics that each needs to understand about the other to ensure effective collaboration? Yeah, for sure. So the two disciplines of design and engineering, we talked a bit about process, and we talked a bit about the objectives. Um, designers will often be in this very ambiguous path where they're exploring all these qualitative types of information. They'll be talking to users, pulling out quotes. Sometimes they get into some quantitative info and insight from surveys, um, but it's very much exploring this very large set of things out there. Engineers are much more quantitative and empirical and KPI driven. You know, you're building an algorithm, you're trying to improve latency, you're trying to improve efficiency. And those two types of ideas, the numbers versus the quotes, sometimes clash. And we'll see that uh, engineers might get frustrated with designers or vice versa. The engineer will want to build, they want to get straight to writing code, and they're seeing the designers as slowing them down because they want to talk to two or three users. Um, the role of the designer in many cases, the UXer in many cases, is to uh, really bring that empathy from their users into the process and communicate clearly with the team what they're hearing from their customers to really drive this uh, team level uh, adoption of user experience. Um, so it's it's a little bit of a, a tension as this field is still developing and as companies are adopting it, and it is getting better and easier as more teams understand the value in UX. Um, but there is that sort of uh, push back and forth between the two sides of how are we collecting data and how are we then driving that data towards our final goal and what is the priority? Got it, that makes sense. So it sounds like uh... UX designers and software engineers bring their own strengths to the table when they collaborate, and that's what allows them to uh, be an effective team. So my next question is, how do software engineers and UX designers differ with quantitative thinking versus qualitative thinking? And how can these different ways of thinking pose challenges when collaborating? And as you may expect, what can people do to overcome these challenges? Yeah, for sure. So engineers want the numbers. I'm a statistician. so. We want to know what was your sample size when you went out and did this research study. The first question an engineer with a background in math is going to ask. Uh, a designer will probably say five. There's five is sort of this rule of fives. It's a kind of a design cliche that um, as you go out and start talking to customers and start talking to users, after the fifth person, you'll start to hear the same things over and over again. You'll have enough insight, enough data from those first five that you have diminishing returns of your uh, output. And when I first heard this, I was like, no, that's that's a load of uh, a baloney. That's that's not a thing. It, you need to have a larger sample set or else there's no statistical power here. Um, and then as I started practicing and seeing and observing, it actually ends up being the case. Um, so it's a difficult thing when you're an engineer to sort of accept some of the process that is coming out of uh, UX. And it is a relatively new field, but at the same time, UX is a subset or a, an extension of HCI, human computer interface, and it's behavioral psychology is sort of the backbone of, of that. And that is an established field of study that's been around since the 70s and 80s. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a challenge at first for engineers to accept this qualitative thinking. It's a little bit of a challenge for designers to communicate it sometimes. But one thing that I, I do in my course uh, pretty heavily is talk about how do these two sides communicate both. How do you communicate with empirical stakeholders? There are some tools that you can use to make that a little bit more uh, transparent or a little bit easier for that stakeholder co to consume. Um, there's a spreadsheet involved in one of them because empirical people love spreadsheets. Um, designers often don't. Um, and then from the other side, engineers often don't communicate clearly how difficult things are or how things will be built or how does it how much? How many resources do we have available to actually solve the problem that the designer is thinking about? And I, I talk a bit about how does a designer coax out some of that information? What does the conversation look like? Um, so that's one of the areas where, um, as an engineer teaching a UX course, I've got a little bit of a different uh, lens on, on the problem and how you can approach those types of things. Got it. That's awesome. I'm so good to hear that. Or it's great to hear that you're covering both of those different ways of thinking and how to make sure that um, you're teaching both types of thinking to UX designers so that they can better collaborate with engineers. So 
there's a design cliche uh, which says build the right product versus building the product right. Uh, and that's often said um, that engineers want to build the product right, even if it's not the right product for users. Do you think this is true? And is there a conflict here between designers and engineers? To a point, yeah. So yep, yeah, there'll probably be hundreds of blog posts if you Google that expression. Um, not, not a bad thing. Everyone has an interesting opinion on this kind of concept. Um, but ultimately, uh, an engineer will want to engineer a solution and you want to solve that thing well. So you'll be writing that optimal sort algorithm to make things that much faster. Um, the designer will also be wanting to solve that thing well. So it's early in the process, a designer might have an idea and might want to latch onto that thing and go out and test it immediately. Um, so both sides are kind of in the same ballpark of, well, we can solve the thing right, but what a designer will often do and what is really part of the design process as a whole is stepping back, taking that kind of bird's eye view of the problem space, the workspace, whatever it is you're, you're trying to accomplish, and really identify the key areas of that problem definition. So not just say, hey, we've got this opportunity and it's this big blob of a thing, but say, hey, there's this little point of that big blob that is the low hanging fruit that everyone needs. And that's what we're gonna build really, really well. And that is the right thing to start. And we have reasons, we talk to users, we have survey data, we have all of these different tools that we've used to say that right there is where we're starting. And that's what an engineer usually doesn't jump to first. They don't go to that uh, kind of problem definition uh, immediately. It's just not the way that we're trained in when we're taking CS courses or any engineering courses. We're, we're trained to take some kind of product scope, some, some kind of uh, product specification document and turn that into something that someone can use. Got it. Okay. That's great. So we have about five more questions before we jump into Q&A. So this is just another reminder uh, for the audience out there um, and those attending this webinar. Uh, feel free to add your Q&A questions. Um, and in about probably five, 10 more minutes, we'll, we'll start doing some Q&A with Gabe. Um, great, so, so Gabe, my next question is, we talked a lot about collaboration between software engineers and UX designers. So if I'm an engineer, what's a good medium or place to meet UX designers and practice collaborating with them? Yeah, so luckily designers are very social. Uh, they're all over the place. Um, right now, if you're in pretty much any big city, uh, meetup.com will have a tremendous number of uh, both design, but also computer science uh, type of events where there are uh, young professionals entering the space, established professionals who wanna share their insight and their experience. Um, and these events are super accessible. You just show up, start making friends and learn from each other. Um, there are pretty much probably two or three a week that I, I know of and I sometimes frequent in New York City alone. Um, the other places are uh, slightly more accessible if you're not in an urban center. So Dribble and Behance are two websites that designers will post their projects to and you can elicit feedback, you can share comments, um, and you can essentially network through this online platform. Uh, for designers, on the other side, GitHub is a really interesting place to find interesting projects that developers are working on. So both of those act as showcases of the best things that these people are working on, interesting projects, interesting applications. One thing that I think could be an opportunity if someone wants to pick up this design project is merging those two things. So there's all these dribble ideas, there's all these uh, app interfaces and beautiful designed animations and beautiful flows for actually interacting with product ideas. And on the other side, there's really good code, there's really good libraries, there's really good uh, machine learning engines that exist in GitHub. And the bridge doesn't really happen to make something that takes this great idea in uh, drawing and this great implementation in code and turns it into a product. So what I would love to see, and maybe some of the students out of uh, the, the uh, nanodegree sequence, what I would love to see is taking both of those things and merging them into real world products through this kind of online collaboration and discovery of things that are ideas and implementation and making them real. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. and. And what's awesome about the UX Design and Degree program is you can choose to do research on any topic, and that's a great research topic uh, for, for students to, yeah. to work on. So just putting out there, if you're taking UX uh, Design and Degree program and want to focus on that research topic, 
you have an affirmation from Gabe that uh, this could be a potentially cool project to work on. Um, awesome. So as you mentioned, you're a CTO and you've hired UX designers to work on your projects. So when hiring UX designers to work on a project that they are working on, what should they look for? And how can they ensure that the skills in the person matches the product that they or their company uh, is building? Yeah, so the that's a good question. So the first thing an applicant should look for in a company uh, is that they are embracing design. Um, it's sometimes uh, difficult for a company to bring in a first or second uh, UX designer because there's kind of traditional process and traditional uh, sorts of, uh, you know, uh, thinking in place to prevent that company from being an interesting place to, to jump in as a junior designer. Um, often a company that has two or three or four or five uh, senior designers who've been at the company for five or six years, that's a good place for a new hire to go, a new uh, UXer to go to for a first opportunity. Because there's people there that are established, you won't have so many hurdles to jump over with management and uh, the engineering teams and so on. Design is, is embraced and you'll have someone who can guide you through the process. Um, the other side of that is when, when hiring, um, essentially I look for in a candidate someone who has done a little bit of homework, they know what it is we're doing, if they have some interest in the space, in legal technology, I'm finding actually some people are really interested in law. I didn't realize that, I didn't think it was a very sexy field when I was jumping into it. Um, but also that they've demonstrated uh, the UX process and the, an understanding in the value of user experience uh, through a, a portfolio pieces. So a website, something where you are showing your skill, showing a process, not just showing the output, but showing your thought process into how you got to that end goal. So something along the lines of quotes or your research methodology or uh, iterative uh, prototypes from uh, version A to B to C to D and how you got to that end goal of uh, what it was that you built. Um, that's really the first step in, in pretty much any UX process is showing that you not only have done it, but that you have done it with thinking involved. So that's that's sort of the, the little insight, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, as a hiring um, manager for UX from my side. Got it, got it. Super helpful. I'm sure a lot of people can benefit from that. So you talked a lot about the um, ideal outcomes uh, when applying design, but what are some of the hardest and most overlooked challenges of design and applying UX design in projects? Yeah, that's a great question. That was uh, one of the reasons I started URSA. Um, so what we originally found uh, with that project, so essentially URSA spun out of uh, my master's degree uh, thesis, uh, working with a, a big design firm in, in New York City, global design firm, but their New York City office. Um, where there's no time for any of this. <laughs> so businesses are always trying to sprint, they're always trying to ship new product, they're trying to develop new things, and the designer says we need to talk to 10 users. And talking to 10 users takes a lot of time. You have to find the right users, you have to screen them, you have to schedule calls, you have to do the calls, you have to transcribe the conversation, you have to synthesize the data, you have to make decisions. There's a lot that goes into talking to 10 people. So Ursa was, actually streamlining the transcription part. We said, okay, you can have the recording, we'll make your transcript available immediately, and it, you pre-annotate it so you can synthesize much faster. So time is sort of the biggest thing across every UX team that designers wish they had more of. If you had another two weeks on a project, you can get a lot more data and a lot more insight uh, from your customers. The other side is budget. So there's never enough money to spend on talking to those people. You have to incentivize them, you have to get a conference room, you have to travel to where they are to talk with them. Uh, there's a lot of uh, resources that you need in order to accomplish uh, the design goals. So one thing that uh, I teach in, in my course is what I call guerrilla design. Uh, it's essentially uh, taking this design process and making it super, super lean. So if you're working at a large company, a, a Fortune 500 that has a budget or a late stage startup that has a budget, uh, you often still have that time challenge, but you can throw some money at that time challenge and you can uh, get some good results. If you're working at a startup, an early stage small venture, you often don't. So we teach some scrappy little skills to get through the process cheaper, leaner, 
still fast and get the insight that you that you need to to drive forward. And then that is, I think, complemented very well by the two uh, designers who are flanking me in the nano degree, both of which are uh, Google designers. So they have that big tech, big uh, design sort of uh, experience where they have a bit more budget to work with and a bit more room to play. That's awesome. That's so cool that uh, your company used UX design plus engineering to build technology that solved a UX design problem in industry. Very that's, meta. That's, yeah, very, very meta inception, right? So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I think as you were talking about your, your startup, I think what would be interesting for the audience um, to hear would be how your startup addresses some of these challenges, right? I know you, you just shared a few stories, but obviously startups are known for low budgets and not enough people to get the work done. So how does your startup address these challenges of design? And what does your design practice look like in your startup? Yeah, so at Feather Ducks, uh, we are uh, essentially leveraging our network and our, our my tools at Ursa to essentially uh, make this process much cleaner. So as we are doing research, we are taking small little pieces of insight from uh, many different uh, attorneys, and we're dribbling kind of through the process. So instead of doing these one hour, two hour long deep dive research sessions, which we did in the beginning, the, the first batch of research was structured and very, it took us time. We were very scrappy with how we incentivize people and we got meetings and conversations just by sheer luck in some cases. Um, but now we're taking an approach to basically say, hey, we've got this small little thing. We're going to do a small little test and see the results and continue to iterate. And we're working with uh, teams of uh, freelance designers and, and people with, within our network to help make that more cost effective, um, but still a part of our core principles. Got it. Awesome. So we, we've talked a ton about UX design and, and kind of the value and the benefit and how the user experience design and nanodegree program uh, from Udacity really prepares people to learn these skills. So what is the next step following this nano degree? Yeah. So this nano degree gets you ready to get your feet wet. So after this ND, you got to go out and find some projects to work on, find some engineers who have some ideas, find some customers who have a need, and get your get your experience, uh, hit the ground running hard, build a portfolio, show off your skill, hone your skill, because it's a process that really needs practicing. It's not just like you learn it and then you can go deploy it just immediately. It's one of those things where you'll encounter new challenges. Each project you do, you'll find each time you talk to a different type of customer, you have to do it in a little bit of a different way. You'll need to understand each type of problem space. How do you explore that ecosystem? So I guess one more example from my, my legal tech company, we didn't just talk to lawyers. We had to learn how to talk to lawyers in a language that, that they speak, which is very different from product and tech. And then we had to talk with the other stakeholders in the firm, like the IT staff and the CTOs and the security officers. And all of these different stakeholders are people where we had to navigate and understand and realize how do we actually solve a problem that this person can use, but also satisfies everyone adjacent. And that's going to be different on each project. And that's the kind of experience that you only get from trying and doing. Um, so coming out the gate from this nano degree, you go out and you find some uh, projects to, to get more experience. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Great. So now we're going to move to a time of Q&A. So hopefully you have already submitted some questions you want to ask Gabe. Um, and I'll be looking through the Q&A section to uh, ask these questions to Gabe. So based on the questions that you have submitted, the first one that I will ask the Gabe is from Suman. Uh, so Suman is asking, how does learning UX design help being a product a project manager or a product manager? Sure. Yeah, we've been talking about engineering uh, for most of this talk, um, but the same types of skills that engineers uh, need to hone to get closer to their customers to solve problems are equally important or more important in some cases with product and project. So as a product manager, your role is to figure out the business metrics that you're trying to hit and what you need to do to get to those metrics. And the best way to do that is through talking to customers. So whether you're a PM who's actually uh, drawing the, the designs or you're just talking with the customers and working with the team of designers and engineers to solve those problems, if you're closer to your customer, you'll be building better products. It's pretty much that simple. 
Got it. Awesome. So the next question um, is, what resources do you recommend to engineers to learn UX? So aside from aside from our nano degree, which uh, we just shipped, um, there are other types of uh, tools online or blog posts online. Um, it, it, doing a quick search for Google uh, on, on Google for uh, different types of uh, UX methodologies, mixed methods research um, is a good place to start. Um, there is much less free content in this space um, than in engineering where there's tutorials. That's one of the things that really was exciting to me about teaching this course. Um, there's a, just a, a little bit of a void. Um, right now, the discipline, since it's younger and newer, uh, is very much driven by uh, HCI and, and other types of uh, graduate level degrees in many cases. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, being being resourceful and and you know, going through the nano degree and, and then taking the next step to talk to more designers and, and networks to see what's worked for them is, is a good place to start. Got it. The so next question is from Jordan. Uh, the question is, I have a small company that designs websites. Why should I learn oh. UX instead of looking up themes online and coding them up? So it's not about the look and feel always. Um, and that's a common misconception between UX and UI. So user experience, the X part, uh, really is the entire end-to-end -end experience of what that person, what that user is seeing. So the interface, the theme, I'm guilty of using themes all the time because uh, it's fast, it's easy, it's inexpensive, but it doesn't get to the why we're doing it or what we're doing it for. Uh, it's a implementation technique. So as a web designer, uh, you have two stakeholders that you need to care about. Your customer, the person you're designing the website for, you need to understand their expectations, their requirements, what will make them happy, and you need to understand the customer's customer. You need to know what is the information that they even want on the page? What is the information hierarchy? What are the things that are going to excite them? The value proposition, how do we present graphics and images in a way that clearly communicates what we need to that user? And we go through the entire process in, in the course, but also uh, go into some things like A-B testing and optimizing. So there might be two or three or four ideas that you have after talking to customers about what excites them. Then you can do things like optimizing uh, content by showing three or four different variants and seeing which one performs the best. So it takes it from just the interface level, which is the themes, and adding that data and insight on top of it. Got it. So our next question is uh, is pretty interesting. Uh, it's what will demand be for UX designers in the next five years? Interesting. I think higher than it is currently. Uh, so we're seeing companies uh, across the board increasing their UX uh, teams. Uh, many companies are reorging in, uh, in a way that basically uh, has more designers per unit engineer. Traditionally, it was sort of uh, maybe one design team that serviced many different uh, engineering pods, they would have requests and so on, kind of like an internal consultancy model. Um, what's happening now is those designers are working directly on a team with two or three or four engineers and a PM. Um, so as the space is maturing and developing and more uh, people in the field are graduating with these skill sets, uh, the design role is becoming uh, more and more uh, frequently leveraged by companies. So I, I see it growing um, very, very much uh, rapidly in the next few years. Got it. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and this next question is a pretty common one that I think a lot of students will ask. Uh, what is the difference between UX and UI? And does this program, so does the nano degree program cover both? Yeah, so I mentioned some of the, the differences there between interface, so the thing that people see and click and touch, uh, and then the experience, the why we're building the thing, the understanding of the customer to build the right thing. Um, this nano degree does cover both. So we cover uh, from research and understanding to implementation and actual prototyping of interfaces to improving that interface. Um, the key is we take all of the UI uh, approach with a UX lens. So we're not just saying this button goes here. We're not just saying this button should look like this and have this kind of drop shadow because that looks great. Um, we are focusing on the experience of that button. Where is it placed? Is it confusing? Does the uh, does it have visual cues so that the user knows they can interact with it? Is it a primary or secondary kind of button? That, those kinds of things that improve the entire experience is really what I focus on in uh, in my course. Got it. 
All right, next question um, is, are there common design patterns that UX designers use that have been shown to provide better user experiences? Yes, yes, so uh, I, that's something I also cover a lot in, in my course, uh, the common design patterns where you don't have to reinvent the, the wheel. So um, unless you're doing something uh, super innovative with design, um, for some reason, the first thing that comes to mind is Tinder. They invented the swipe paradigm where you choose one way or the other. That is basically an entire business built around a UI design pattern that was unproven, uh, and it worked. Um, unless you're doing something like that as the core value proposition, speedy choosing of, of people, uh, then you know you want to go with something that people have seen before that they know before. E email and password, single sign-on. You don't see a lot of alternatives. Sometimes there's new ones with multi-factor authentication on cell phones. And as we get more and more intense with security, there's more and more things that options that are available, but you're not gonna trust some new thing on a website that asks you to take a photo of your face and also wave or do some weird thing. It's gonna be unusual to you. So we cover some of the core design patterns that uh, designers can implement, the core components that are easily implemented by engineers um, and how those things kind of allow you to build products quickly and effectively without taking too many risks. Awesome, thanks for sharing that example. I thought that was pretty helpful to explain that. Um, so the next question is, in which environment or platform should beginner designers work and test their skills? Yeah, so beginner designers uh, start small and consumable. Uh, the two areas are uh, ideally if you can find a, a position with a senior designer, someone who has experience, someone who has uh, been working in UX for a long time, can understand how to communicate with a team, um, then you'll learn from that person. If that is hard to find, uh, then finding a freelance kind of gig, something with a small company or friend startup, some, some idea that uh, someone you know has. Um, take their concept, even if they don't necessarily realize they need UX, and work with them and help them to get their product into a position where it, it is more developed, more designed, better to use. Um, it's a low barrier to get into something like that usually. Uh, it's just a matter of reaching out and having a conversation around goals and, and objectives. Um, and that's a good way to start building that portfolio so that you can jump into that next step. Got it, makes sense. Um, all right, so next quick Q&A question. Um, are UX professionals divided into two roles? UX researchers concerned with collecting data mm. and UX designers concerned with designing and usability? or is it only one role concerned with the entire process of creating and integrating a product? Yeah, you sound like one of my investors. Um, so that is a big question. Um, it is different uh, across different organizations and it depends on how uh, that company operates. So there are many instances of uh, designers doing both roles at many smaller companies or uh, lean, agile kinds of companies, uh, they will have uh, one person who's split between research and design and floats back and forth between those tasks. Um, at larger firms, larger uh, organizations, uh, especially things like uh, agencies, design agencies who are dedicated to this kind of process, you'll see that there is a split between researchers and uh, designers more often than not. The researchers are really good at writing discussion guides, they're really good at recruiting, they're really good at conducting interviews unbiased, and then the designers are really good at making everything look beautiful and clickable and interactive. Um, there might be some looping between those two where once the interface designer implements the uh, actual design, the researcher takes that back out to their customers to iterate and user test and understand what works and what doesn't work. Um, but uh, in that setting, it does exist in two different places. Um, one thing that's actionable and, and sort of something that you can start thinking about through the, the, the nano degree or, or as you start to enter the space is what do you like more? If you really like that research side, if you're into talking to customers and building that, that relationship and that empathy, then research might be something more interested. And that's a good question to ask in an interview and you don't know what to say when they say, what, what are you, what are your questions for me? Uh, if you're more interested in, in uh, UI design and interfacing, uh, same thing. Start to sketch more, draw more, do some heuristic reviews and hone that skill. Um, ultimately, the path starts kind of narrow and then you can bifurcate as you as you move through it. Got it. The next one I'd love to actually hear your perspective on. Uh, how many people are needed when conducting user research? Yeah, um, it depends. Uh, it depends on 
your objectives primarily. So if you're trying to do a usability test, so taking something that you've designed and you want to see if it works and where it breaks, that's where that rule of five I mentioned earlier comes in. So if you are uh, talking to five people and three of them start uh, clicking the wrong button or get stuck on a flow or don't know where to go next, your prototype is broken, stop talking to people, go back, fix it, and take the next design out. Um, the other side of it, so why did we talk to 70 attorneys then when we started our company? Um, well, we didn't know what we were going to be doing. We were starting by saying, we think there is an opportunity in the space and we need to build a deep understanding before we really hone in and select something. We ended up at this large number partially because we started with a different type of user than where we ended up with. We were starting with law firm attorneys and then we started to move and navigate around into in-house attorneys and then we started talking to stakeholders surrounding those attorneys. Um, and as we were doing that, we were building this mental model of all of these different stakeholders and personas that exist in all of these different places. So that was a much more exploratory, open-ended ethnography study where we were understanding just generally what does this person, this persona, what do they look like and what do they need? What are their problems? So different use case, different objectives, um, much larger study. So that Got didn't it. directly answer it. It's the attorney answer. It depends. <laughs> of course, like many, many uh, answers to questions, right? Yeah. Um, so next question uh, is probably a very common question that um, students will ask too is, are A-B testers and UX designers the same or different roles? So A-B tester is usually not a role. Uh, it's a it's a responsibility that often falls onto a designer. It might fall onto a product manager. It might fall onto the web the web developer, the, the webmaster, webmaster, going back to the 90s there. Um, but it, it really depends on the organization. Um, it is a tool that a designer will often recommend or act, uh, implement themselves. Um, it's one of those uh, kind of, so the concept, I suppose, is as you're having more research questions, you need different methodologies to answer those questions. If you get deadlocked in uh, an understand, uh, let's say, say, for example, you have two possible uh, interactions and you're not sure what is more uh, important to the user. Well, the first thing you might want to do is track which ones do they go to more frequently. Second thing you might want to do is A-B test to see if you put those buttons in a different order well, do your results change? So it's uh, more of a method than a responsibility uh, or, or rather a role. Got it. That's a great way to answer that. I like how you kind of differentiate those two. Um, okay, so next question. What aspect of UX would you recommend to focus on in a new small company? So imagine a company of five engineers that has an idea about UX but isn't doing anything about it. So if I understood the question correctly, the company is uh, building UX tools? So my understanding is they have an idea about UX and wanting to use it in their company. Implementing their startup. Yeah, Got it. yeah, yeah, exactly. But they just haven't done anything yet. Uh, go talk to customers, not sell them. So this is a mistake I see all of my, my founder friends make. Um, when starting businesses and operating businesses and raising money and you can be successful by going straight out and selling. Um, but you can often find better success uh, if you slow yourself down with the whole sales process and really back out and start asking questions. So if you go into a meeting with a potential customer and you unpack why and what and how they, they do things, um, you'll have much deeper insight uh, into what you're building. Um, so stop selling uh, is, and I, I, you know, if uh, you're asking that question, you're probably doing more selling than you are asking. Um, so that's probably the most actionable thing that I've learned in my experience. Got it. And let's say you, you're working in an organization of just engineers um, mm -hmm. or, or your team is very engineering focused and they're not implementing UX design in their practice yet or in their product mm -hmm. development. How do you sell the practice of UX design? to yeah. your organization? The best way to do it is to have the engineers participate. So do something small, do a small study on something that's a little bit low stakes, something that everyone can sort of understand, and then do this. Basically bring all the engineers onto a Google Hangouts, put the camera in the room, have them take notes during the uh, recording session, uh, and 
um, essentially bring them into the process. And once they start to see and understand and uh, hear directly from the customer, they start to get a little bit hooked and a little bit more engaged and a little bit more open to the idea of doing this kind of research. Um, that's something that we were uh, working on at URSA, something we were seeing the more successful teams were doing very frequently is bringing everyone in, not just engineers, but management, PMs, executives, uh, just as many people as possible. Building that empathy really just drives the understanding of why the discipline exists. Got it. Next question. Um, what are the subfields and soft skills in UX design that are most relevant and helpful? Sorry, most relevant and helpful for software developers. So tapping into like human psychology, empathy for user needs, et cetera. Yeah. So the first thing that you need to, I guess, hone or practice is being wrong. Uh, engineers don't like being wrong. I don't like being wrong. Um, but as a designer, you'll quickly learn you're very frequently wrong. Um, so the button layout that you thought was super easy and super intuitive makes absolutely no sense when you put it in front of people. Um, your understanding of how someone would use your product often is completely wrong. Um, so that's that's the first thing of, of just becoming comfortable with just being incorrect and needing to go back and do it again. It doesn't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean that you're stupid. It means that you are trying and taking risks and you're finding the right path. Uh, that That is the first kind of tangible thing. The second is becoming comfortable talking to people. Um, it's very frequent that you'll want to go straight to that keyboard and start programming. Um, you might want to ask a few questions of your manager. You might want to do a little whiteboard exercise to really understand what you're designing. Um, if you talk to two or three people before jumping into a project, you'll probably realize that there's a better way to solve it. And that soft skill of just going out, asking unbiased questions, uh, non-leading questions, uh, is really something that that is critical through this entire process. Got it. So this next question you kind of touched upon in our um, conversation earlier, but what are the biggest challenges one will face as a UX designer? Yeah, so I mentioned time and, and budget. Um, those are the two most, I suppose, uh, tangible, measurable sorts of problems. Um, the other areas uh, will, I suppose, to add a little bit of uh, flavor and some, some new content, uh, design debt is going to be another one that designers will often face at, at, mo at every company, small or, or large. Unless you're coming into a company that is just launching a brand new product, then design debt exists. There are processes in place that have been established. There are design language components that have been established and used across the product or across the marketing material even. So being able to go in and understand what the company has done, understand where you can make an impact and how you can actually make changes within that that doesn't break everything is another area that designers uh, need to, to understand before just diving in. Got it. All right, well, we are coming close to the end of our time. Gabe, thanks for taking the time to be with us today and answering the questions from our audience. If your question was not asked, Gabe has been gracious enough to make himself available to answer additional questions that we didn't have time to cover today. If you wanna reach Gabe, please connect with him on LinkedIn and he will do his best to get back to you there. Gabes, thanks again for so much of your time, and we are very excited to hear about your new nanogree that you've worked on with Udacity. Your perspective as an engineer on UX design was invaluable today, and if you wanna learn more about Udacity's user experience design and nanodegree program, please check it out um, at the, on Udacity's website. Thank you so much for your time, Gabe, appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. Take care.